So historian and broadcaster Michael Woods is a professor of public history at the University of Manchester and also an author of some 120 documentaries dating back to the late 1970s. His six-part documentary series, The Story of China, explores Chinese history and civilization, which allows us to understand more about today's China. So what inspired your interest in China and what made you decide to do a documentary on Chinese history and civilization? Oh, well, that's a long story. Um, I was really, I got interested in China when I was at school and uh, you know, first of all, buying books of Chinese poets and that kind of stuff. And then when I was at university, I shared a house with a sinologist who was forever pushing books my way, saying, you've got to read this, you know. And, and um, so I kept an interest. And then I first went to China in the early 80s and uh, really enjoyed it. And f fantastic, you know, fascinating, eternally fascinating country. And I first filmed in China in the late 80s, so um, I've had a long connection with it in some ways. And, and the, these films came about because we'd done a big series on the history of India, which is just over 10 years ago now, Story of India. And after that, everybody said, including the BBC, well, why don't you do the story of China? You know, so um, it came out of a long interest, but it also came out of the work that we were we were doing at that time. So there are problems in being so constricted by time. You've got to make a very hard selection process of which bits of the story you cover and how you cover it. But um, you're making it accessible to a huge audience and that's the really great thing. And actually with the story of China, I, I think I've never been stopped so many times in the tube and in on the buses and in the streets by ordinary members of the public saying, I had no idea, you know. I had no idea Chinese history was so rich. I had no idea that it was so old. I had no idea the Chinese people were so much fun, you know. Uh, I mean, the reactions to it were really great. So what does this series set out to achieve? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, the, the remit of doing these films were made for the BBC, although we're independent filmmakers, and you're always trying to do that mix that lies behind public service broadcasting, which is to inform and to educate and to entertain. And so it's got to be a mix of all of them. You can't just do an academic discussion on the kind of Qing dynasty or something like that. It's got to have life and vitality. And so... Uh, you're setting out to tell the big story, but you're setting out to tell it in the living culture, you know, that's the crucial thing. And you're, you're involving the Chinese people. And so all through the series you meet the Chinese people on the street, you know, what's doing things, telling you things, storytellers, this, that and the other, you know. And um, that went down very well in China. I mean, people, people loved that. The online responses to the films, you know. Uh, they, they, yeah, they loved it. I mean, somebody wrote on one of the online discussions, they're showing what we're really like, that we're fun, you know. And uh, the, I, I can't reiterate that enough, really. I mean, that, and that was my impression from the very first time I ever went to China, you know. That, um, and you're also trying to... I think combat certain prejudices about China, certain kind of tropes that forever appear on television to the point where if I were Chinese I'd be going up the wall, you know. You only ever see programs which talk about uh, extreme development, one party state, uh, you know, all those sort of things, environment. Uh, you don't see these kind of things very often that really plunge you into the culture and show you the culture. So you're trying to combat that as well as well I think in a kind of friendly way you know um, so I think those kind of motives lie behind it although I'm a historian so you obviously you're you're also trying to tell a, what you choose to tell has got to make sense and give an accurate feel of the of the history how did you decide which aspects of Chinese history to include from such a fast subject um, if we'd have had eight films we would have also done a film about the Han dynasty, probably, and we might have done one about the Mongol dynasty, or we might have made more on the 20th century, because really the 20th century you could do a whole series. Um, so six films, you have a brutal choice, you see. So it was fairly obvious you'd do the, the origins. You've got to do the Tang dynasty, because it's not only Chinese people's favourite dynasty, but it's an incredibly 
fascinating period when China goes out to the world. I wanted to, to do the Song Dynasty because it's so creative before the European Renaissance. It, they do so many great things. And actually that was a very good call because the response in China to the Song Dynasty program was particularly terrific. You know, people said, ah, oh, I never thought of it that way. You've got to do the Ming because everybody's heard of the Great Wall and the Forbidden City and, you know, Zheng He's voyages. And, um, and then the Qing, you know, the 18th century is a really great period of uh, Chinese culture and civilization. And, and it also includes the first time that the British and the Chinese come together with the McCartney mission. So, um, and then obviously the the age of revolution from really from the opium war to the 1949 made a, a fantastic last program but could have made an entire series so that was the selection process on Chinese history and it's really brutal you know because you you're missing out 10 films would have been great can you share one of your most memorable moments um, from the filming series like anything crazy happen Wow. Crazy, whatever you want. Yeah, I mean there were so many great, so many great moments. I mean we had, we had such a wonderful time. Um, great difficulty escaping overeating, of course, in China because you, you, you know, wherever you went, you'd be going into some godforsaken wilds to follow the kind of Taiping rebels, and the local governor would kind of take, invite you to dinner and. And of course with Chinese film crews, it's not like with British film crews. In British film crews you can give them a sandwich at lunchtime and virtually tell them to carry on working. In China, if it gets to like five past twelve, the crew look really, really nervous. It's not that they don't work incredibly hard. I've never worked with better film crews, more conscientious, more hard working, any hours, but you cannot forgo lunch, <laughs> you know. So um, uh, those kind of things used to make us laugh. But so many great things, yeah, some of the some of the cultural things were just out of this world, you know, the storytelling house in Yangzhou where the, the traditional storytellers still, you buy your bowl of noodles and you sit down and you, and you listen, you know, um, really, really great, but lots of great experiences, yeah. Amazing. What lessons can the modern world learn from Chinese history and civilization? Well, that's a very big question and it's a question that, uh, of course, they're very concerned within China at the moment, you know, the kind of big emphasis now on the glories of Chinese civilization and, and uh, uh, big emphasis on, um, you know, the values of Chinese civilization is really coming back strongly. Um, I think the long lasting nature of Chinese civilization is really a major thing, you know. You look at Europe. 27 countries or whatever it is, you know, and they do share a common history in many important ways, you know, Christianity, Latin civilization for a, a lot of that, the area, um, but they've been broken up and fighting wars since the Roman Empire. Um, now China has at times broken up uh, and there have been wars, the end of the Tang, the end of the Ming, so on, but um, it was always China since BC, you know, and, and uh, that sense of that there is such a thing as Han culture, Han civilization, along with the Han language and so on, this is our culture, you know, it's a really, really big thing in China and I think it gives a fantastic stability to um, um, China now. There are so many other things, of course, that are really important, um, you know, the invention and the commercial side of the civilization. Politically, one thing that has struck me very strongly uh, over this time has been, uh, and they haven't shaken it off, is the, is the powerful image of the sage leader, you know, the wise leader. This starts at least with the Zhou and the mandate of heaven in, in the 11th century BC. And uh, it's an incredibly strong thing in Chinese culture. And you've got to come down to Chairman Mao. They never escaped it, you know, with Mao's Red Book and Mao's... Um, that seductive image of the great leader who is also, is not only all, all wise but all powerful, has at times saved China, but at times been a real hindrance to China's development, I think. And so there's a million big themes you could, in, to answer your question, but, um, you know, politically that's a really interesting question, I think, that uh, uh, is still, still an important issue. 
But the centralization of power in China, um, you know, you can understand why with all the things that have happened to China, for a population that big, um, over so many centuries, um, why their solutions to how you run a state are different from those that were adopted by a myriad small western countries you know, on the seaboard of the Atlantic whose development was very different. It's a different matter ruling a country this size. You know. As Jimmy Carter tells the story that when he made some flip joke about um, uh, America and the difficulties of running America and Deng Xiaoping said to him, you should try ruling China, you know. So China's political solutions have been driven by a different kind of history, I think. So those are the kinds of themes that you think about, the big themes you think about as you're traveling and making films. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about your new film that covers the 40th anniversary of Deng's reform and opening up. Yeah, we... Um, we shot it last summer a series of films in China for the 40th anniversary of, of the reform and opening up of Deng Xiaoping. The exact date, of course, is a kind of, of the 40th anniversary is they celebrated it in December, I think, in Beijing, because, um, uh, you know, that was the moment when Deng made his famous speech at the, and the third plenum took place. Uh, you could equally say it was when Deng went to America in early, 70, early 79 or when the real economic reforms began in the spring of 79. But it's over that period. So we made five films um, on education, science, technology, business, environment, uh, in each of which we talked to witnesses from 40 years ago and to people now. And those have already gone out in China. Uh, interesting response. We, um, we made a 45 second promo on my iPhone <laughs> to the new year and we got 100 million hits in 24 hours, yeah, on the Tencent website. So uh, interest, there's a lot of interest. So those have already gone out and we're making a, a one hour for uh, Western consumption, which we're still, in fact, I've just come straight from the cutting room uh, now, we're still, we're just sending tonight a, another version off to our Chinese co-producers. Um, Certain delicate matters, as you can imagine, in Chinese politics, these things change all the time and sometimes you say things and they think, can you say it a different way? And sometimes you say things and you're really surprised that they have let it go, you know. I mean, the environment film, I was so surprised. We'd got some amazing footage of the damage to the Chinese environment. And I mean, the film was positive about the future, you know, but um, I was really surprised that they didn't bat an eyelid about that, you know, so it changes from day to day Chinese politics really, you know, you know what it's like, I mean, we interviewed Wen Yuan Kai, who's a famous professor of chemistry, who was at the famous education conference in 77 and he had a conversation with Deng Xiaoping where he made the recommendation for uh, opening of the, starting again the university exams and these should be the conditions and Deng accepted them, so he had the conversation, he was young then. And initially, for some reason we could never fathom, we were told, no, you can't have him, he can't, he can't be in the film. And then suddenly they said, all right, yes, you can, you know. And uh, he'd, he'd suddenly been there at the December, the December um, uh, celebrations of the 40th, and uh, now it was okay. So you can never quite tell. Mm. What are the most significant changes that have taken place over the past 40 years? Right. Um, uh, well... Everybody will tell you it's the biggest lifting out of poverty of the largest number of people in the history of the world. So that's a major, major thing. And that was the number one goal of Deng Xiaoping when he came back to power. Um, he, uh, the speech that he made before the third plenum in, in December 78, that's the biggest thing that was on his mind, you know, that uh, he couldn't, he couldn't, dismiss the, the Mao legacy and he probably didn't want to but in certain important areas the, it had been a real failure and the people were in a terrible state, the economy was in a terrible state, education was in a terrible state, the cultural revolution had really turned things upside down and Deng had a very clear idea of what he thought they should do and it starts with the education thing, it starts with 
agricultural reform, the rolling up of the commune system, giving big business the means to operate, creating the special economic zones, allowing small business to flourish. We've got in the film, we've got a great interview with the lady in Wenzhou who gets the first business certificate, private business certificate. And she'd actually been selling uh, knitting made by her neighbors in the streets. And uh, when the news came that you could start a private business, her dad said, you've got to go straight down and register. What shall I do? She said, he said, buttons, buttons. These are the things. Everybody wants buttons. And so, and she still got her button shop in Wenzhou. So we couldn't resist going to Wenzhou to interview her, you know. So uh, all these things happened in an amazing kind of uh, rush, really. And uh, so those changes have just been huge, you know, huge. Um, to anybody who travelled there, even in my experience, going back to the early 80s, you know, the very beginning of the reform process, you can't believe it when you, uh, you know, y you walk into cities now which are, you know, then were still low rise and now they're completely surrounded by high rise, you know. And I remember texting my younger daughter when I'd gone back to Nanjing for the first time in about 25 years. I said, you're not going to believe this. But I'm sitting in a Starbucks with a caramel latte and John Coltrane playing <laughs> on the sound system and outside the window I can see this, you know. And so the changes are amazing. Uh, they've still got a long way to go. They would say themselves, you know, they've just last week announced this, um, you know, to get another hundred million out of poverty by the, in the next two years, you know, so they, they, you know, there's still many things to be solved. Um, um, still many issues. The legal system, which Deng Xiaoping in s that speech in 78 said very strongly we have to have a better legal system and they set out to create it and they got somewhere along the path but it's sort of stalled in the early 21st century so um, as everybody's aware I think you know so they still need to think about that um, individual rights still, but they have many great achievements, you know, workers' rights, employment rights, women's rights, many, many real achievements, serious achievements. Is China still opening up? Uh, without a question, yeah, yeah, I'm sure the process will go on, and in its own way, you know, I think it's got to go on really, because um, they're moving out into the world. And the incredibly ambitious projects, you know, the Belt and Road and all these kind of things. Um, I mean, I was on a plane in August and China Daily said I think 130 million Chinese had travelled abroad in 2017. The projection was 160 or 70 million for 2018 and 730 million for 2025 travelling abroad. So it's, it's not possible if you want to be a modern, let's call it democratic socialist state, is what they are saying, a prosperous democratic socialist state, that's the goal for 2049. It's not possible to achieve that um, with that kind of um, opening up in terms of the people of China themselves without um, continuing to open up in other areas, in my view, you know, and uh, so, yeah. I mean, they're very set on the primacy of the Communist Party, but then so was Deng Xiaoping in 1978. All that, what he said was, we must have greater democracy within the system of a one-party state. If they can achieve that, then it will be very interesting. But I think the rule of law is, is, is the area where they need to think most. That would be my, my view. You know, that's kind of stalled. And, uh, and you don't, I've, spent, I've just spent five years in China and, and, and everybody's you know, they are grateful for everything that's happened, they can do all these things that they could never do, the freedoms of ordinary Chinese people continue to grow, but uh, everybody's aware where these things run up against uh, brick walls, and some of them irritate people a lot. So uh, that's for them to sort out, not for anybody in the outside world to lecture them, you know, but, you know, you know as you asked, I've kind of, that's my impression from the last five years of being in China, you know. Having first gone to China in the early 80s, you know, this is not that long after the Cultural Revolution. And in the, a lot of the outlying cities, people were still just wearing the Mao suits, you know, the grey or the green or the blue with a Mao hat. And um, 
And although everybody was very welcoming, they looked as if they'd been through very tough times, you know, and people were quite reticent and there were things they didn't talk about and so on. Going back this last period of time, since 2013, um, the difference almost psychologically in the culture is just incredible. You, every Chinese person is an individual. This, everything is individualistic. You know, the, the idea that some foreigners have that somehow this society is very regimented and, and people aren't individuals is just crazy. You know, every person was an individual. Every person had an opinion. Nobody was phased by a Western camera crew coming up to them on the street and saying, tell me what you think. First day's filming, we were in Shaoxing to, um, in, to do uh, Chu Jin to do a thing about Chu Jin, you know, and as you know, she was executed in 1906. <clears throat> and the monument is to Chu Jin is in the Shaoxing um, main street, shopping street. And we just carried the camera up to ordinary Chinese women who were carrying their shopping. Who's Chu Jin? Tell us about Chu Jin. Why does she matter? Everybody had a story to tell. Just ordinary people, not, not scholars, you know. Oh, she, she showed women can be heroes too. You know, every, all the remarks were great. Um, we could have used so many more than we actually, than we actually did, because everybody had something to say. So I think my big impression is simply that uh, um, that change in the people of China, psychologically, after everything that they'd gone through, and you think the old generation had gone through the Japanese invasion, the civil war, the great leap forward, the famine, the cultural revolution, the older generation had been through all that. And now um, you see them on, and the, as you know, tourism in China is massive. So you go to any historical place where we were filming and there'd be three generations of people, the grandchildren, the parents and the grandparents. And the grandparents would be, you know, wearing Abercrombie and Fitch t-shirts and kind of with their cameras and they're uh, looking happy and comfortable in their skin. Do you know what I mean? And uh, that's the product of the time, I think. And uh, it struck me very strongly, having spent time in the early 80s and then now, the contrast is big. So um, those are the kind of things that you notice about the ordinary people of China. You've been watching China Minutes. Please like, comment and share.